Who's heard of Ouya? <laughs> Who backed Ouya? Thank you, every single one of you. Um, who was a developer kit backer? You were. No? So all of you, I guess, are probably still waiting for yours. I can assure you our manufacturing plant is now going full throttle. Um, and hopefully you guys will see yours in the next few weeks. And when they arrive, the stuff you'll learn today will hopefully allow you to write your own games, apps, whatever you want to put on it. Because one of the things we want to do with Ouya is make it open. So although we're pushing games at the moment and we are focused on being a games console, that doesn't mean you can't write a fantastic media streaming application or some other form of application that makes sense in the context of a TV in the lounge that people are going to enjoy. So for those who don't know about Ouya, and judging by the number of hands that went up, there's very few of you out there, which is good to see. We were Kickstarter project. Unlike what some people have said and what some people do with Kickstarter, it wasn't a case of we went to Kickstarter with a, a preformed idea. We went to Kickstarter after we looked for venture capital funding. Um, the venture capitalists weren't that interested, so we went to Kickstarter and said, look, let's go to the fans. Let's cut the middle guys out. Let's see if there really is support for this there. And we wanted $950,000. That's what we reckon we needed to make it, get it out in people's hands. We got nearly $8.6 million. <laughs> Believe me, every single person is, was stunned by that. We, we were absolutely bowled over that 63,500 people thought it was worth putting up money for before we'd managed to get anything out the door. And that, that really is, I can't tell you how much that blows everyone away. And every time someone in the company mentions it, it, it gives us a thought that there are 63,500 people out there who want this to happen. December last year, we shipped over a 1,000 developer kits to those guys who back the highest level. Now, a standard OUYA, you can still write software on it. You will still have a micro USB port on it. There's nothing really that different between a standard OUYA and a developer kit OUYA. What they got for their, their extra backing was early access to the hardware. They got focused developer support. And they were the guys who were able to jumpstart their games. And those have been the guys who've contributed to the 120 games available now as we're shipping out the over 60,000 units to people who kick-started us and the early pre-orders. The number we've got was, was massive. I don't know the exact number. I know someone would probably want me to tell it. I don't know what it is. I'm removed from that side of the business purely because once it went over 60,000, it scared the bejesus out of me. It's going to go to retail in June. Um, it's not going to retail in every single country around the world. That doesn't mean you can't go to Amazon and order one. Uh, Amazon in the States and order one. Amazon in Germany and order one. You can't game in the UK. All it means is that we're going to stagger the rollout to make sure we do things right. This is, we're a startup company. We're not so, a company that's been around for two, three, four generations of consoles. This is something we want to get right and we want to do it right. And the last thing we want to do is annoy those 63,500 people and everyone else by getting things wrong. So, a bit about Ouya in Germany. Amazon DE was the first retailer to announce that they were going to provide ordering of the Ouya outside of North America. And believe it or not, parts of the Ouya are developed in Berlin. There is a company called Novoda who We've made use of them as contractors. They've given us some quality codes, some great ideas, and they are, they've contributed to it. It's developed in multiple European countries. You may see it as a US-only product. You've got the wrong image. There are people around the globe working on it. Most of the stuff in the US is because a large percentage of the pre-orders and the Kickstarter backers came from the States. I mean, Kickstarter is an American site, so it kind of makes sense, but it is a global global operation. We have people in the Far East, we have people in Europe, we have people in the States. The sun never sets on Ouya and hasn't for a long time. We've always got someone in a time zone awake looking at things. And we've accepted global console orders from day one. We didn't say we're only going to make them available in one country. Anybody who Kickstarter backed it, anybody who pre-ordered it could come from it, pretty much any country on the world and we would ship one to them. And now to the bit that interests developers, the ODK and why we didn't call it the Ouya SDK. Basically, there were too many SDKs in the mix already. We just needed an easy way to distinguish the Ouya developer kit from the Android SDK, the Unity SDK, which some developers use for writing games. We just wanted some way where if someone came to us and said, I've got a problem with the ODK, we knew which component it was on about. It's easier to tweet. 
it may seem sort of only those extra few characters, but when there's 140 involved in a tweet, they're all, they're all really something that counts. And it sounded nice to us, it sounded easy, it's not something that's hard to say. So what does an OU run? That's an OU running. It's modified version of Android 4.1.2. What you'll notice is there's no status bar, there's no navigation bar. And although we allow people to develop on any device, for example, that is an Nexus 7 running it, what you'll see is you've got the navigation bar along the bottom. So you don't get the full of your experience on other devices because you're not using the full 720p resolution, 1080p resolution, whatever you set it to. You are getting a good idea of what a user will see. So it's always good to run things on the console itself, but if you've got a tablet, you want to work on, a new, on the ODK, get your application up and running so you can do some final testing later on. You can use a Nexus 7. We've had people developing on Nexus 4s. And before you wonder about interacting with it, we've got it working with touch. So you don't have to worry about connecting a controller up or anything else like that. So that will bring up us. There you go. That's our Play Store. And we've got Manage. You see it's all touch-based. So you guys can go download the ODK. You can develop on a device. Switching back to the slides, we can see that the slight change that we've made is that the current activity is king. When gamers play games, the last thing they want is network performance being degraded by things downloading in the background. So if you've got a social network that downloads stuff in the background, if you've got something that provides updates that it downloads in the background, gamers playing consoles don't want to know about that. They just want to play the game they're playing. So it's going to be slightly different in that you'll find that activities aren't allowed to linger around in the background and act actual applications can't linger around very long. So we've accounted for the situation where someone might dip into a settings or and come back to your game and things like that. But if you're expecting people to work on one game, then switch to another game and then come back to your game and your game will still be in memory, it's not going to happen. And we have the UYA libraries for in-app purchasing because, hey, who doesn't need some new in-app purchasing libraries? Um, the reason we do it is we have to develop our own solution. We're not licensed for the Google applications or anything like that, so we can't piggyback on the Google Play system. We can't piggyback on other people's systems. We're talking to various payment providers about adding options, but the whole ethos of UYA is we're very much driven by what we're told by the developers and what we're told by the customers. We want to make this a good development experience and a good customer experience. And that means that the number of people are in the office accept the fact that we don't know everything. We're not going to be able to come up with the perfect idea. So we have our in-app purchasing libraries. They changed during the developer kit run to improve the cryptography routines and the security on purchasing. Similarly, if people come to us and say, we need to look at this, that, and the other, those influence our development priorities. So what do you need to develop for Anuya? Standard Android tools. We don't expect you to do anything special. You can go onto Google's site for Android, download them. They'll work. The UU Development Kit, that's where our custom stuff comes in. If you're thinking about button mappings, they're the standard Android button mappings, slightly rearranged to go with the OUYA key layout. There's no special values in it. It's just literally a mapping for convenience. The UU Development Kit also includes our in-app purchasing libraries. Um, we have some save uh, data saving routines, which allow you to save your game data. So if a user uninstalls your game, reinstalls it later, you can persist that between uninstall and reinstall. That doesn't mean it can be abused, by the way. Don't think about saving 200 megs worth of maps or whatever using that system. It will be trimmed depending on how much you're saving, how much the user's using it, and various other criteria like that. If you can run the Android tools, you can develop for the UU. That's the base message of it. If you guys, how many of you are already running the Android development tools, running Android apps? How many of you think you can write your apps with those tools? Good, I'm getting the message across and you're still awake. This is looking good. <laughs> what helps you develop? A console, as I was saying before, we've got rid of the nav bar, we've got rid of the status bar. You want the full experience. We've also got Tegra 3 processor in there. You 
ideally will want to use a console for testing at some point. We have groups of developers in the UK who meet up irregularly, once a month, once every six weeks, and they try out games. The guys who've got consoles bring them along. Those who haven't try their games out, and it's all very friendly. It's a great way for people to get to know each other, and it's also a great way to socialise. The end of those meetups tends to end up with a pub and beer involved, so there's always a good side effect to those as well. A good IDE always helps. We use IntelliJ, uh, IntelliJ's idea. People like Eclipse, whatever you like. If it develops for Android, it'll develop for an OUYA. There's the Tegra Android Developer Pack. If you really want to squeeze performance out of it, you really want to use the best forms of texture compression to get the most out of the Tegra 3 architecture, you want to download that te uh, Tegra Android Developer Pack from NVIDIA because it's got tools, it's got documentation, it's got everything that will allow you to squeeze that last little drop out. And friends to test with. This is the difference between many of the Android devices at the moment and the Ouya. You can have four controllers, you can have eight controllers, you can have controllers in different configurations. So it's no longer a one-person playing experience, it can be a multi-person player experience. So, how to start coding. It's going to be kind of like teaching you guys how to suck eggs for the first couple of slides, but I just want to make sure the message goes over. We've got the documentation on GitHub, and it's rendered more nicely on our website. We do take pull requests, um, we do take translation information, we do take patches to it. We put it up there. As we said, if, if we get six or seven guys submitting German translations, French translations, Fre Flemish translations, we will try and hook those in, make sure that they actually say what they should, they should say, and then make sure that we can get those out to you via GitHub. And then when we do a next major release, we'll look at rendering those on our site. You've got to learn Android developer. I'm development. I'm kind of guessing most of you in here already know it. There are a few resources that can help. Roto Myers, um, professional <laughs> Android development book, very good book. Uh, Mark Murphy's Busy Coder's Guide to Android Development and Google's training site, all excellent resources for learning how to program Android. You can install the ADT bundle if you haven't got tools installed already. Um, Google do a great job of making this easy for you. They want people to develop on Android. We don't see any point in duplicating all the effort they've made. We just want to make sure that you guys understand that it's Android tools, it is Android at the core. If you have a console already, read the setup documents. We're going to be submitting a patch to uh, Google because we have our own USB vendor ID. Now, for most of you, it's something that never makes any difference, but the way that drivers work on Windows and the way that ADB works under Linux and MacOS, you have to have a list of vendor IDs of devices that you want to talk to via ADB. Ours isn't in that list at the moment. There is a way of manually adding it. It's in that document. If you plug in your OUYA, and you do ADB devices and you don't see it in the list, you more than likely not got that entry in the, uh, the relevant file in your ADB setup. It's possible that you haven't got developer uh, the USB debugging turned on in developer op options, but every OUYA ships with that on by default. So every OUYA is set up to be a dev device straight out of the box. If you haven't got a console, try a tablet. This is Nexus 7 running the software. Runs a launcher, runs a framework, gives you access to all the features that you'll need to access. Tegra 3 based will bring you as close to the kind of performance as you can expect from an OUYA. 1920 by 1080 is what you're going to see on a 1080p TV. Our launcher is a 1080p um, launcher. It's designed at 1080p. We will run at 1080p wherever possible. We do fail back to 720p for lower resolution TVs. And if you're not using HDMI, because you're using a converter of some kind, we drop back to 480p, because part of the HDMI protocol allows us to negotiate the best resolution that we can offer the user. Layouts will scale, but if you're working with OpenGL, having that full resolution from an OUYA console, or if you can do it some other way, having the full re resolution available to you is really useful to making sure you can understand how things have scaled and how well things fit on the screen. If you want to go really basic old school, you can do it via emulation. You should look at the HackSem extensions on MacOS. They really are quite stunning. They re make a difference. If you've ever used emulation before and you haven't used HackSem, you will 
be blown away. It, in a nutshell, it makes it usable. <laughs> Resolution, again, 1080p, 720p if you want to. This is one of the things. With the Tegra 3, it will upscale 720p resolution screens. So if you write your game for 720p, the Tegra 3 hardware will handle upscaling or downscaling from 1080p down to 720p, however you want. And we're on API level 16. That's 4.1. That is not the latest. We know that. But that is what was shipping and what was available when we started shipping dev kits. And what we're not in the business of is shipping out a dev kit and then saying to developers, by the way, you've spent three months on this version of Android. We're going to upgrade it on you. That's, there are people who would love us to be on the latest version. We understand that. We know that. But for us, stability is very important because we want to make sure that everything works and developers have a predictable experience and they don't suddenly find out that a small increase in version has introduced a whole load of multi-user features that their application doesn't work well with. You can download the ODK from our developer portal, devs.ouya.tv. That's the address you want. That will allow you to download it. It'll allow you to register as a developer. It'll allow you to upload your games, submit them for review, and there is no charge for any of this. The only time that you share money with Ouya is with the in-app purchases. We take the standard 70-30 split, but there's no registration fee. There's no yearly licensing fee for the development kit. If you want to develop, we'll give you all the tools. You can download them. You can get started, and it's not going to cost you a penny. So, Ouya ring your emulator or your device. Two components of the ODK are that we call them Ouya Framework and Ouya Launcher to make them nice and easy to recognize as our components. The framework provides the functionality which is part of the core OS on the device. We, these are the extensions that we've added. These are the things we've done to try and make it more of a console than, say, your tablet or your phone. The launcher is what you'll see in most of the reviews. That's the orange background. That's the this thing here uh, that's on the screen at the moment where you saw with the pairing controllers. The launcher is that component. There is a split between the two because when you're playing a game, the launcher may be thrown out of memory. So the framework is the stuff that will, be, that will stay on the Ouya, and that's things like content providers for, say, game data and things like that. You include the jars that are in the ODK in your project. I've specifically not listed the jars because sometimes we add stuff, sometimes we optimize things out. So if you download an ODK, it's worth checking the supporting libraries to make sure that you've got the relevant ones for the ODK you're using. That doesn't mean that when you go from ODK 1.0.2 to 1.0.3, if you don't do the upgrade and don't release a new version of the application, it's going to crash. It won't. We're backwards compatible. It just means check when you're using a new ODK. You've only got the libraries you need. Now, your applications icon. This is something that we've added in so that you can put it into existing Android applications without interfering with them. You've probably all seen the screenshots where it's a rectangular shape. And we measure it in pixels, old-fashioned pixels, because we know there are only two resolutions we're going to be working at. And because our launcher is actually only ever rendered at 1080, uh, 1080p resolution and downscaled by hardware if it's running on 720, we know that we have 732 by 412 pixels in which we can put your icon. Don't ask me why we ended up with that resolution. That wasn't part of the code I worked on. I would have loved to have seen it a round number because nobody ever remembers it. So the Ouya launch intent. What we've done is we've introduced a new intent to mark the entry point into your game for the Ouya. This allows you to firstly mark your application as being designed to support the Ouya. And secondly, if you wanted to, you could have potentially a second entry point one for phones and tablets, one for the Ouya. It's about making sure that you can give the users the best experience and you can distinguish between a normal device and the Ouya if you want to. You may not want to, but there are some applications that may want to present, say, a touch-based interface for selecting difficulty levels, player numbers, and things like that, as well as having a more controller-focused interface on the Ouya. That's possible. And then we have the pause intent. When the system menu appears, so that's the orange overlay, we inform your, your application via a broadcast intent that we are popping that up. That gives you a chance to 
pause anything you need to pause so you can pause your event game event loops pop up a, some kind of notification saying it's paused it means that when the user goes back to your game they don't suddenly have to think oh my god i'm back playing again it allows you the chance to get a bit of logic in before we tell your app to go through the on pause and on destroy process we have content review guidelines they're up on the web they do change as we find people abusing the system and doing things which aren't really that great, we will modify them, we'll add things in. Again, it's an iterative process. We've started off what we think works. If consumers or developers tell us that they're spotting things in games that really make it annoying for them and they want to see taken out, we'll work with developers, we'll see what makes sense and we may introduce new rules into the content review guidelines. In a nutshell, a lot of it is common, common sense. If you think it's going to be offensive to someone, you're probably not going to make it through the review process. We have some very shy and timid people who review your games before they're going into the store. And if one of them runs out of the room screaming, it usually means we're not going to pass it. It should not rely on a network connect connection. Some of these things are going to be sitting in people's homes, and no matter how great it would be to have worldwide always connected devices, it doesn't happen in reality. There are power outages um, in various exchanges and things like that that can knock people off the internet. So don't rely on having that network connection around. And have a read through the content guidelines. As you'll see, a lot of them are common sense. A lot of them are things you wouldn't normally do, but we want to state them so that it's very clear where we're starting from and what kind of rules that we want to put in place. We have interface guidelines, and we have a set of buttons that are the controller buttons, OUYA, some people love it, some people hate it, some people think the A's in the wrong place, the O's in the wrong place. Those are the buttons we've got. That's the controller's decisions we've made. Hardware is not as easy to change as software, and we can't ask people to start rubbing off the fronts of their controllers and relabeling the buttons just because we want to shift them around a bit. Think about how you'd use the buttons. You might want to do something quite clever, but you've also got to put in your user interface a way that the user will realize that. It took me about two days to realize on one game you can change the difficulty level by using the trigger buttons and you don't have to use the touchpad. Because in case you guys weren't aware, we have a touchpad on the controller. It's not something we advise you use for user interaction. It's ideally supposed to be used for gestures. So you might play an RPG and you want to have a gesture for doing a certain type of spell or something like that. It's best to make your user interface controller friendly. but the, the touchpad is there for the, adding that extra little bit of functionality if you want to. It is unlikely you'll pass the review if you rely on the touchpad for users to play your game. You may find they come back and put it politely, but it's not something we want it's to see is the mouse cursor popping up and people having to use the tiny touchpad to change the difficulty level, change the players and that. We want to see controllers used for that kind of thing. And it's not difficult in Android. There's a lot of stuff to support D-pads and input methods like that. So there's no real reason why you couldn't do it with a bit of effort. And yes, we understand it's effort and we appreciate it. In return, we make sure that you're, you're well looked after on the Ouya. Designing for TV. Google TV does a great job of describing some of the problems. And before anyone thinks we're a Google TV competitor, we're not. Different markets. Matt, who works for Google in London, is a developer ad for Google TV and I. We get on well. We have chats. There's no animosity there. We're not out with a killer product that's going to ruin Google's Google TV strategy. It's a very different market we're aiming at. So don't see us as either Google TV or Ouya. If you want to do both, do both. You're going to be most likely looking at different sets of users. One of the things that they highlight and we, we highlight as well is overscan. Users still have TVs that cut off about 5% all the way around of your image. Don't put your score in the very top right in very small fonts because you will find that people will be saying, I don't know what my score is, I can't see it. Don't put anything critical at very edges of the screen. That's re-emphasizing that. It really is something that will, if you're using an, a modern TV without any kind of overscan problems, you'll think your game looks perfect you'll see users really upset with it because overscan TVs are over there. So you, once you take out that 5%, you again end up with a lovely memorable resolution of 1,728 by 9, 972 pixels. Not really easily memorable, but 
if you you work on a rough guideline of 1720 by 970 you're going to do pretty well and make that centered make sure it's centered don't try and stick it in the top left because that five percent is the top left as well don't go for full brightness colors this is something that we've seen made as a mistake when you're dealing with a tablet, you've got a calibrated LCD display that's very difficult for the user to alter the brightness and contrast levels to silly high values. On TVs, that's not the case. If you go into your local electronics retailer that's got multiple TVs, you'll find that they've usually got brightness and contrast whack, whacked up so high that if you put that in your um, home where you're in a darker lit environment, it actually just glows in the dark. It's kind of scary levels. So. As a rough guide, think of F0 instead of FF as the highest you should go in any RGB value. In-app purchases. Now, this is how users pay you. Every game has to have free content. We want to make the experience for consumers great, and the only way we can ensure that is if they're allowed to try your games. Now, some of you may think, oh, that's a harsh rule. Oh, how am I going to make money? If you look on pretty much any platform that has paid applications and in-app payments, the amount of money generated by in-app payments is if not equivalent to greater than the amount of money you get from buying apps. People are far more happy about spending multiple 99 cents uh, on little purchases than they will be on a 5.99 single application that they may try once and never use again. We've secured it via cryptography. Private key doesn't leave our servers. This is all standard stuff. This is all the kind of things that everybody else does for you, Apple, Google. It's familiar territory, but it will be slightly different the way we've implemented it. This is because, <coughs> although APIs are public, a lot of algorithms aren't. So we have to implement it in the way that we've designed, and we've worked with developers who have the early dev kits. And we work in that kind of way. We, we iterate over things. So you'll see things that are slightly different, but it's the way that developers have helped us to come up with. It makes use of an application-specific key. <coughs> again, this is something you'll see time and time again. It's how a lot of uh, stores work. There's details on our GitHub documentation. You can read through it. And we are working of, on a globally available server to per verify purchases, so you can do server-to-server -server purchase verification. This means you don't have to rely on us on the console saying that something has been purchased. <coughs> In the future, you will be able to go from your server to our server and verify that users have paid for a subscription that you're providing data for. Security is about making things difficult, not impossible. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, it's true of any security. No security is 100% perfect. Security is about making sure that the effort that's needed for a reward is so high that it's not worth putting in the effort. We can only do so much, but you've got to help yourselves by using tools like DexGuard, ProGuard, and things like that, obfuscators. They're a very good tool for making it very much more difficult for um, low-end, medium-range hackers to just reverse, reverse your code find out what's going on. High-end hackers will always spend months on this kind of stuff, and if they really want your app, they may get it. But if you want to knock out the 90%, 95% of script, script kiddies who just want to download something and try it out uh, to see if they can reverse engineer it and knock out purchasing routines or purchase testing, get yourself an obfuscator. That will go a long way to doing the job. And there's a great talk from IO in 2011 called Evading Pirates and Stopping Vampires. Watch it. Enjoy it. It's a very fun talk to watch. You might not believe that, but I, I believe me, once you've read it, once you've listened to it and watched it through, you'll have a better idea of the problems. As for game data, we have put in this API I was talking about before that allows you to store data on the device independent of installation and uninstallation of your game. We understand that that's something that is not necessarily a standard part of an Android experience, but it's something that console gamers expect. A lot of the current generation console games are involved discs that users take out, put back in, and their saved game data still exists on their device. We've put in a special API. 
at the moment it's storing the information locally so you can't move between consoles and get the same game da saved game data on both consoles but it is something that we're going to look to expand on and we look for feedback on as to what people want us to do with it whether you want to be able to mark data that gets synchronized out to the cloud whether you just want it backed up what you want to do with it as developers is what will shape how we develop the solution we will trim it as i was saying 200 mega maps you're not going to have that sitting around very long it's not a let's dump everything here storage system to make sure that it's always here when we're installed it is purely about saving state in a simple possible form so you can recreate a good gamer experience there are casual gamers and the price point the year is there are going to be people who just dip in and out of the games you want to be able to save the state you want to be for them to be able to play for half an hour 20 minutes come out go back in maybe uninstall come back to it six months later and go around and play again it's good if you use this api because it will allow you to give them that consistent experience so they can pick up where they left off. We do also in the ODK have a method which will tell you if you're running on your hardware. So there is a very simple call that you can use. It's, I believe it's called is running on your hardware, where if that returns false, because that comes as part of the jars that you put into your libraries of your project, if that returns false, you're not going to get your saved game data back. It's not worth trying our APIs if that is not is that not there. You may be running on a Nexus 7, but you don't know what's going on in that environment. So we would recommend that you use that is on your hardware if you only want people to purchase or use certain facilities on an OUYA device. Higher end graphics. If you, who's familiar with Unity? We hired a guy to write a Unity plugin for us. We still have him on staff. He runs weekly sessions. His name is Tim Groutman. He is an excellent coder. He's a good laugh. He works extremely long hours. And he likes a game that involves snowmen shooting at each other at the moment, which is, yeah. It's one that made me sort of go, OK. But it actually is quite a fun game. So if you want a quick shortcut into doing high-end 3D gaming, we've put support behind Unity. We are going to be supporting other game frameworks as time goes by. But Unity was the one that we had the most demand for. And as I was saying before, developer demand shapes our development priorities. People tell us they want Unity. We're going to work on a Unity plugin. So questions? Any questions? Yep. We have OUYA IDs. The question was, are we going to do some form of social gaming system um, that allows you to play a match and things like that? We have OUYA IDs which identify people within a game. And currently, we're looking at making it so the ID that you get in one game is not the same as another game. Um, so you may have to do a secondary login. Again, this is something we're looking for feedback on from developers as to whether it, it makes sense, whether they think it would be too difficult. We are going to develop the solution. Um, we are not stopping people using existing solutions like Lounge from And Labs. Um, we are, again, what comes out is going to depend on developer feedback. We know it's needed. We know people want it. We know people want to see it. But if people turn around to us and say there's already a really great library out there that does everything you need to do, go and use that rather than giving us another solution to plug in, we'll work with those people to make sure that we can work with that particular framework. Both. You can have a multiplayer feature in a game that has an offline mode. Look at Halo, look at all of those games. Okay, but uh, uh, online multiplayer isn't something you're looking at uh, at the moment? You can do online multiplayer with a number of libraries, but what we're not doing at the moment is providing you with an OUYA solution. Okay. At the moment, you have to look at what you want to use in your application <coughs> for the multiplayer aspects. So something like Lounge could solve, the, the guys are here, talk to them, that could solve your needs for the multiplayer aspect but you should also include a single player aspect that allows people to play offline. Okay. Yep.
where I, at the moment I can say it's not been ruled out. Um, it is a possibility. We're looking at currently the development time, uh, the development iterations are very, very tight for us. So we don't want to release something that it takes you guys as long to get familiar with as it does for us to put the next lot of code out. Once things stabilize a bit more, if we get more requests for it, it it's something we have planned to do, so we've not made decisions which, which will rule open sourcing parts out, but it's currently not something I can give you details of when that will happen, how it will happen, and what parts will be involved. Okay? We will look at, basically you're looking at say Ouya 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, yeah. whatever. Mobile yeah, or Ouya Mobile or whatever. Um, we will look to try and make it backwards compatible. Um, we, we understand that without developers we don't have an ecosystem. We don't have a product. If you're not writing games for it, nobody's going to want to play a console that doesn't have any games. So when a future version comes up, we will talk with developers and see what makes sense to provide you with as an upgrade path, whether it makes sense for us to maintain APIs and maintain features. It's always going to be about us talking to you guys to make sure that we understand what you need and trying to give you that for the upgrades to future versions. Thank you.